Welcome to Think Like a Dog podcast, where we explore dog behavior and psychology-based training to help your dog achieve their full potential. I know. It has been. Welcome back to Think Like a Dog podcast. Thank you guys so much for joining us once again. Uh, today we have Millie and we have Victoria here with us. You never introduced me. <laughs> Did you know that? I feel like I have to now because, you know, the last few episodes we've been doing you and then sometimes it's Jill. And, you know, if you're That's listening true. to I feel honored to be introduced. You never <laughs> introduced me. The one and only <laughs> Millie. <laughs> Oh, let's keep it like that. I like that opener. The one and only, the <laughs> the lady that calls me out whenever whenever she has a chance. Yeah, we just got into an argument right before we press record. Yes. So, uh, Victoria, thank you, thank you so much for joining us today and for um, being a supporter of the podcast and for being willing to come on and talk to us about your business and some of your passions. So, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself, your business? And just some background of how you even got started into um, getting into dog training. Yeah, of course. Um, thanks for having me on. I'm super excited to be here. I really love the podcast. Um, and I'm just really excited to be a guest on the podcast. Um, so I am Victoria. I have um, owned my company. It's called From the Heart Dog Services. And I've owned that for about four years. Um, I got into training um, actually through the rescue world. So I um, had always owned a boxer. Um, her name was Maggie and she was my first adult purchase when I was 19. I got a puppy and um, she was great. And I think a lot of people can relate to this story because um, she was perfect. Like my first dog was perfect as far as, <laughs> you know, behavioral problems. Um, I wanted to give back. I started, I was really advancing in my career. I used to work in the automotive industry before I worked in, um, as a dog trainer and I wanted to be able to give back. So I felt like I was at a point in my career. So I started volunteering, um, for Boxer Haven Rescue, which is a local, uh, rescue here in Michigan. And they're obviously breed specific. And, um, my husband and I, he was my boyfriend at the time, but uh, decided that we were going to start fostering and Maggie was getting older. And so we needed like a calmer, older dog to start. And we, so anyway, we got this, we volunteered to foster this dog named Rufio and he was a stray. Um, and we brought him in and 10 days later after we brought him, um, we actually lost Maggie. So mm. that was really hard. And we were like, we just kind of looked at each other and we were like, this dog's not going anywhere. And before I knew anything about training, um, it was in the winter time. We didn't really like walk him a lot. And he was, um, so as the weather started changing and we started getting him out in public more, we started noticing that he was having, um, severe, like dangerous leash reactivity. And that was kind of eye opening because we had such a great dog before that loved people. And, you know, she was just great with everything. And, um, he was great in the house, but if he was in the backyard and you walked through the gate, like I would fear for, for your life. Mm -hmm. And if he was on the, the leash, he was on his back legs, he was biting, he was redirecting, he was going nuts. And so Sean and my husband and I were looking, we're like, we're in way over our heads. So we started um, researching and I just kind of looked at him that day and I was just like, Rufio. And I was like, man, you're just not comfortable. Like, this is not how I think that you should be living. Like dogs should enjoy walks and you are freaking out. And so we started doing some more research on training and um, I I really fell in love with the process of training and trying to help Rufio. I went through quite a few different trainers, quite a few different experiences. I really wasn't having a lot of success at first. And I'm like, I just like, I really like this process. And uh, in the meantime, we ended up getting a female uh, that was a puppy. And so I'm like, I just want her to be good. Like, I don't, you know, I, I don't want to deal with behavior problems. And so I fell in love with the process. I started researching um, and I 
kind of came up with my like own style and uh, a friend of mine was like, Hey, I saw you started training dogs. And I was like, well, I don't really train dogs. I trained my own dogs and I learned from a different, you know, a couple different trainers, but she was like, no, you train dogs. You're going to come over and <laughs> train my dog. And I was like, okay. So I went there and, um, her dog stayed with me for a couple weeks and she referred me and I was booked the entire summer. Awesome. So meanwhile, yeah. So meanwhile, I was, um, in, I was working in automotive as a full-time career. In the meantime, COVID hit. And so they were like laying us off. I had a lot of extra time. And, um, so then I started to, you know, train dogs on the side. I started noticing that, um, like I, Sean, my husband was like, you know, you're starting to have like other people's dogs here all the time. <laughs> you know, they're like, we never have a weekend without a dog. And I was like, okay. And so in 2022, we got married and, um, <laughs> we were on our honeymoon. I was like, so I think I want to quit my job. <laughs> and he was like, okay, what's the plan? And um, I was just like, I really think that I can give this a go with the dog training thing. Um, I was boarding dogs. I started, um, I actually went on like Rover and I started trying to board and rescue and foster as many dogs as I could. So I could start to just practice with all the different breeds. Cause I was really experienced with boxers because I always fostered them. And, but I, which boxers are very hard to train. And, <laughs> um, but I needed to get more, you know, breed experience. And so I really just started training my boarding dogs, which, you know, it helped me, but I didn't like have to correlate it to the owners. And I would pull in a little bit tougher fosters to try to work with. Um, and then I, I came across, um, Sherry Lucas. I I didn't know who she was until then. And then um, I was like, I really want to go to her workshop. And I was able to go to her workshop that was um, in Knoxville last year. And that's actually where I got to meet you, Millie. And I got to meet Easton and I got connected with the podcast. Um, And anyway, so that's basically kind of how I got started is that I'm very self-taught and I practiced a lot on um, boarding dogs, rescue dogs. And I just kind of grew my business and I'm always trying to learn new things. And I've, you know, I've, I've learned a lot from you actually, Millie, just listening to the podcast. And I just, I really love what you represent from a training perspective. And I think we align on that even just from meeting you at the workshop. Um, and you know, both being trained and kind of mentored by Sherry, I think that that's, helps make help us have a really good connection. Oh yeah. Um, and, and we actually, have a very similar story. I mean, in 2020 oh, really? COVID is what made me, um, be able to quit my job and, and go, cause everyone got a dog in COVID and then all of those uh-huh. dogs got separation anxiety. So I oh, was right. <laughs> booked. Um, yes. Yeah, so, um, COVID is, is honestly, it was, a um, kind of a nice, not nice, right. It was a pandemic, but it was a catalyst for me <laughs> to be able to, um, to, to turn this passion into my career. I think that that's similar for a lot of dog trainers. Like, um, I went to a, a workshop. I can't remember where, I can't remember which workshop I heard this at, but somebody was like, well, Hey, you know, it's COVID. And because of COVID, I'm not having, um, I'm not getting booked. And then the, whoever, I can't remember who, who this was, but whoever was giving the workshop was like, well, then you've got a problem. If you're not booked during COVID, um, as a dog trainer, you're, there's something going on. There's something wrong. Um, because everybody got a dog during COVID. Everybody did. And all of those dogs had issues and everybody had time to work on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think like COVID was a turning point for a lot of people because it kind of pushed you to go out there and put yourself, you know, out of your comfort zone because it felt kind of like it's now or never kind of thing. Jump or don't. Yeah. Yeah. And I just, I love the way that you um, think about, you know, training and how connected you are with the psychology based training. And even when you wrote the guest form to, to submit it and create to be part of our podcast, I mean, you just really gave us so much information that it, it's great to see that, you know, to be able to know that there's people out there like you, who's genuinely passionate about what you're doing. And you started from a place of love because you cared about these dogs. You wanted to see them get better it was a very personal experience for you. And a lot of people that listen to this podcast, they they have the same 
or they're going through the same things, you know, with their dogs, because they wouldn't be looking for dog training advice if they didn't need tra dog training advice. <laughs> um, but I love that, you know, I love that you even wrote, you want to change the mindset of dog ownership to from, I want my dog to behave to, I get to spend time with I my dog that. and teach them new skills every day. And that's so powerful because in rescue also, we run the Ozzy Albies Foundation, Millie and I, and I talk to a lot of people, we get a lot of adoption applications. And it's so sad to see people just describing this perfect dog, they want the dog to be calm, friendly, never barks, great on the leash, you know, no issues. And they don't understand that comes from them. And then oh, when yeah. we talk to them about that, it's like, we want you to create this relationship with your dog so they can behave the way that you want. And it's we like, want you what, to like, what do you get excited about that? That's get the whole excited. point. Yeah, we that's the whole had, point. We even had a foster. Our rescue is, you know, we work with all breeds, all dogs. And we had a foster, Rusty, <laughs> talk about him all the time here. Um, he was with me for almost two years. And he had, he even pushed me farther along into, you know, really getting out there and giving me the confidence to work with different dogs because my dog Bubbles really started it all for me and got me connected and for me. with Millie <laughs> and like created everything in my, like just turned my life around for the better. Cause mine too. <laughs> he just helped, you know, he's the reason I met Millie. He's the reason we really have the podcast now um, where everything kind of connected, but he gave me such like meeting, meeting, uh, meeting Millie and working with Bubbles gave me such confidence that I felt like I could help any dog in the world at that moment. So when I saw Rusty, I was like, I want that dog. And that was the hardest dog, the dog that had the severe anxiety in the shelter that nobody could pull. I was like, I want him, bring him to me. So I was with him for two years. And the hardest part for me was, you know, trusting someone else to, to take over and to be with him. In my mind, I got to a point, I was like, I'll never be able to adopt this dog out because I don't trust people with him and not, not because he was a bad dog. He's a super smart, super, super sweet. Um, we got him to a point where he's just doesn't really care about other dogs. He's great with people like no severe reactivity. Really. It's just that he needed a responsible person to connect with him, to give him guidance and don't let his fears take control of him. Right. Cause he had fears from different things that happened to him and he really thrived with structure. I mean, like he did great. So when I finally connected with someone who got it, like she knew she had to put Perfect in work, person. she knew she had to connect with him. Like she wasn't expecting him to be a sweet, cuddly dog and be there to just make her happy. Um, we finally got him adopted to like the perfect person. And she puts in the work, like she drives an hour to go to pack walks. Mm -hmm. She keeps us updated. Like the first day home, she had the place board. She had him on place. She was asking questions. Uh, she was all yeah. about like, she's like the muzzles, you know, it's fine. Like I'll use that. She's just awesome. So it's, it's so great to see people that don't expect the dog to be a certain way. Like they know it takes work and to, they have to create that connection. Like with Rusty, he was my baby. Like I protected him. I just wanted to know there was somebody there that was willing to put in the work and not expect him to just lead the way and be this perfect dog. So this mindset that you talk about, is like, I want my dog to behave, change that to, I get time to spend with my dog to well, teach him the skills. We talked about this, um, in our, we have a group zoom Q and a with our membership page and our pack talk the other night. And you can probably attest to this, Victoria. You get two types of clients. You get clients who want you to come out and make your uh, make the dog, I don't know, uh, behave, right? Exactly what you said. You have um, uh, this person who wants you to fix the dog's problems so that the, the problems don't inconvenience them anymore, right? And then you have another type of client who ideally you turn all these types of all of your clients into this second type of client, which is I want my dog to feel better. I want you to help me teach my dog how to feel better, right? So it's these clients who go, okay, I need you to fix this for me because it is, 
um, it's severely inconveniencing me. You see that on the on the training side, but you also we see it on the rescue side when people fill out an application and they put down, um, I want a dog who is going to do this, 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 and this because that is what will make me happy rather than I want a dog who um, I can build a solid re- relationship with and we can do things together, what, what whatever that dog enjoys to do, right? I think that that's such a common thing that I see. It doesn't mean that once you are the first type of client, you come in, you're like, hey, this is the catalyst of what brought me here. Um, That doesn't mean that you can't, obviously a lot of our job is to teach them how to switch that perspective up a little bit into, okay, yes, I know that this is inconveniencing you, but imagine how your dog must feel, right? If if your dog's barking out the window all day, they're not doing that because it's fun. So it's changing their perspective. And I love that's, I mean, that's sort of what you wrote. I'm I'm sure you see that all the time too. Yeah, definitely. I, um, you know, I, you do get the clients that are like, I just want to send my dog to you and I want you to fix them. And I'm like, well, okay. I always, I always caution people when they call me and they want to talk about that because I say to them, training is not guaranteed. I said, you know what I can guarantee you is that your dog will behave with me. I can, I know that because I know how, I know what the steps are. I know what behaviors to watch for. I'm trained in that. That's why you're hiring me. But the goal is not for your dog to be behaved with me. Your dog, we want your dog to live a full, fulfilled life with you. And my style is not going to align with you if you are looking for perfection, if you're looking for instant results, if you're looking to send your dog away to me. I do do board and trains, I, I call them training camps, but the owner is very, very involved in that whole process. They go home on the weekends. They get, I, love that. I, I write really detailed, I wear a microphone and I film myself through every activity that we're doing with the dogs. And I send it, you know, I send it every night so that the owner is getting education while watching me. And of course there are some, you know, behavior cases where you need that, extra time, but the owner has to be willing to really put in the effort. And I always, that's one of the, my biggest things when I'm on the phone with people is I always caution. I'm like, I, I want you to call other trainers. I want you to see the difference in how I'm talking to you about your issues versus telling you I can fix them all. And I think it's hard because as you know, obviously we're competitive, we're business owners, we're, you know, very, um, and at the same, like, we're very driven people. We have to be to be where we are. But we have to sometimes put our pride aside and say, yes, I can fix that dog. But can you live with that dog? Mm-hmm. I don't know. And I think that that's, you know, very hard. So I forgot to mention this earlier, but I am the director of Boxer Haven. So I started out volunteering and I, I ended up taking over the rescue a couple of years ago. And, um, uh, I fostered over 25 dogs, one German shepherd and the rest were all boxers. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's, well, sometimes I have a hard time. Like my, um, my co-director is one of my best friends and she's always like, you can't do applications. Mm-hmm. I always do intake because I oh, can't really? do it. Why? Yeah. I, she's like jokes with me because I'm too picky. Like <laughs> mm, that's a like, similar thing with me and Andrea. <laughs> yeah, so like the one word in that is like for example, if somebody puts on an application, I want to get a dog for my dog. I'm like, no, they can't oh, have yeah. a dog. We feel so, you want. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny though. What you're talking so about. okay, yeah. Andrea and I are very similar, and that's a very similar thing because Andrea will will read one sentence and she'll go, no, definitely not, right? I think it's because she has spent so long in rescue that she sees, um, unfortunately, the worst in people, right? I mean, you see the worst side of people who are going to give up their dog at any little thing, right? Or that if it wasn't exactly what they wanted, they're like, screw this, I don't want to keep the dog. So that's like, in her brain, she's trying to prevent that and also obviously advocate for the dog, right? In my yeah. in my brain, on my side of things, I see these training clients who come in with dogs that have severe behavioral issues and they're like, you're my fifth trainer. I have spent tens of thousands of dollars on this. I'm not giving up. 
but I need help. So I see these people who don't get me wrong. I see, you know, the negative side of it as well, but I'm, I think being in the rescue side, you, you almost get burned. Right. And you're like, I'm not doing this again. You put a wall up and I am, I feel very lucky. I think it's nice to have, um, I, I never noticed, I guess, really that, I have this other side of it where I see people coming in with dogs with behavioral issues and I'm like, how are you doing this? How are you living with this mm -hmm. safely? Right. How have you um, made your life to revolve around your dog like this? So I see this other side of it where I went to loan get an application. I'm like, but maybe they can just need, they just get, need some ed education, right? Maybe they just need somebody to tell them something different. Or maybe if a problem pops up, they'll deal with it because I see people dealing with things that I might not even deal like that I would just I would train or I would you know what I mean I would find yeah. another way of working with it but people just will they love their dogs so much that they'll sit in their dog's issues and they'll they'll rearrange their lives for their dog and Andrea sees the side of it where people aren't going to re rearrange their lives they're just going to give the dog back so that's I mean I'm now seeing both sides of it it's just it's hard when you get those applications to know what you're going to like who this person really is. Are they teachable or, or are, is this somebody who's really just going to pretend to be teachable and not be? I think too, yeah. it, it like balance is important in rescue. Like we have to have so many people involved in that one application to try to filter mm -hmm. it out as much as possible. So I couldn't do it by myself. Like I would never start rescuing if I didn't have Millie and her team by my side because we need that balance, right? When you really care about these dogs, you need someone that's going to see all the bad and you need someone that's going to see the potential and you need the fosters to be involved to, to tell you if they think that's good because maybe we miss something and then I run it by somebody else and then we have someone completely uninvolved that one of the trainers that probably never even have been you know, interacting with the dog, but they'll see that interaction with the different eyes. Like we oh, have yeah. them do the meet and greets sometimes. So we try to get so many different perspectives to, to just filter out all the bad and try to see the good. And that's and not to say Andrea always sees bad. Like I, we switch sometimes, <laughs> right. right? So yeah. with behavior, like when I see a dog's behavioral issues, and this is where Andrea has to talk me down, I see a dog with severe behavioral issues and I'm like, this is a problem. Um, we can't continue, right? Um, we can't adopt this dog out. I don't, I'm going to repeat what I just said because I don't know if Andrea's just gone. Yeah, she got mad no, at me I for can, calling her. Oh. <laughs> I can hear you. You can just keep talking. My camera just gave me issues. Let me Do see. you want me to start over? No, let me see if I can fix this. Okay. Uh, there you go. Oh, there you are. Okay. So <laughs> yeah, that's not to say that Andrea always sees the bad and I'm always like this, I, you know, opt optimistic person. I am my, um, she has to talk me down when I see a dog with behavioral issues. Cause she's like, no, it's fine. We're going to find somebody for him. And I'm like, we can't even post this dog. We can't even adopt this or, or do a meet and greet until this dog's issues are better. So it's, it is, it's a, a system of checks and balances and having somebody there. If you're doing it by yourself, you are, I mean, I can't imagine the second guessing you're doing constantly. I can't, I mean, for anybody out there who's running a rescue by themselves, you're seeing a yeah. very um, limited view of this dog and what you believe that this dog is capable of. And that's why we do try to put these dogs in different foster homes with different things that these fosters can offer. So we know who this dog is outside of a little bubble. It, yeah, exactly. So I think sometimes too, it's that helps keep me grounded a little bit is having a dog go to a family or to a foster that's not, you know, doesn't have the knowledge I do, or maybe have the structure that I do, because I mean, as I'm sure you can relate at my house, you can't not have structure. There's so many dogs in and out of my house. Like it, it doesn't even matter. Like I, you, they have to be on a schedule. Um, where at some of the foster's house, maybe they're not, which is probably more of like real life of the people they're going to be adopted out to. And sometimes it's hard for me because I also see the val the good in the dog as well. But you have to take be willing to take the time to find the owner for that dog because when a when a dog has severe behavior problems a lot of the times it's management for the rest of that dog's life and being proactive and really under, understanding this. And I think sometimes it's very difficult to find somebody that says, I would like to sign up for that. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's like when you have your own dog and it's 
you know, your dog, and then all of a sudden it has behavior issues, you may be a little bit more willing to say, I can do this, I can mm-hmm. change. But like, to your point about how people are living in, you know, um, like catering their life to their dog. It's amazing to me too, on the flip side of that, of how many people are catering their life to their dog, but also either resisting to change. Oh my God. It's, and, it's the choose your hard battle. And it's like, they're, yeah. they're almost in my mind, I'm like, they're choosing the harder thing, right? They're choosing, right. they're, they're limiting their entire lives and revolving their entire lives around their dog. And I'm like, but what if you just crate, what if you just crate train them? <laughs> and like that would, you could go and do things if you wanted and your dog would feel better yeah. too. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, it's so funny because that's like how I feel like it is. It's totally the choose your hard battle because and then it's like sometimes too the crating or the structure that Whatever, hard yeah. battle yeah is temporary like oh yeah it's not meant to be forever but yeah right now you can't travel for 10 years like yeah does that yeah, sound yeah. doable i've worked and with I clients think- who can't leave their house like they are scheduling yeah. their um like their partner or their roommate they are scheduling their work schedules around not having their dog at home alone at all because that's how much we are willing to sacrifice for our dog but we're not will like we're not willing to sort of just face it head on maybe for a, a very temporary period of time um but yeah it's yeah. it's crazy and that's where the whole thing comes back to the applications of like i don't know i've seen people do some crazy things for their dogs like yes they <laughs> yeah. might want this one specific dog but what if i say hey this is a dog that we have that has these issues. I've seen people move heaven and earth to work around behavioral issues. I'm not saying that's the right answer by any means there. You should come head on at it, but that's, it's just, it's, it is amazing to me what people will do to not confront a behavioral issue in their dog. Yeah. yeah. And that's a type of love. It's just a a weirder type type of love to me. (laughs) It's insane. Well, when we, yeah. when we do, uh, t- when I talk to different, you know, applicants and I tell them some information about our program and what we do, what we believe in, um, some of the structure they may have to put in place for that specific dog. I mean, we are, I get it. Cause I'm, I'm not a trainer, you know, I'm a dog owner and she might as well be a trainer. <laughs> and I have like a lot of wiggle room with my dogs and I really can't, like I, understand like some dogs, like some of my dogs, they're so chill. Like they, they can take a lot more than others. And then I have uh, dogs that really can't handle a lot of change. They love their structure. They need that structure. Like we need our walks and we need to, you know, I have to work with them on daily basis to help them cope with different stress. And, um, you know, it's all kinds of different things that you have to put in perspective. And I tell them, about the structure and about the, you know, what they're going to need for that specific dog. And sometimes you can kind of hear it in their voice. It's like, no, I'm not doing that. You know, like I, I, a lot of times, like we, yesterday, Millie and I, we were talking about, you know, one of our rescues, uh, she got a message, an issue happened. And it was one of the dogs that we just like never expected that from. Like we just never thought we would have gotten a message from their owner's for, you know, the issues that they were having, it was just, um, it, it kind of like hit us all at once and we, we never expected it. And I was talking to my mom, I'm like, man, this is so, it's so hard and rescue. Cause we, I'm, I'm thankful that our adopters turn to us when they have issues and they tell us these issues. And, but at the same time, like we are always responsible for this dog mm-hmm. for, the for the rest, rest of, of their life. life. And, you know, if something happens and if for some reason they can't, they don't want to work through it, then we have to scatter and find a way to take them back and like work through it and commit to them. So it's like this weight on our shoulders that no, even if they're adopted six months, seven months go by, you you still have that responsibility with them and you just never know, like you want to get an update, but you don't want to get a bad update. And she's like, you know, you have to remind yourself they're, they're, their personalities change just like us. We have bad days. We have good days. Like if you don't believe, you know, I wouldn't freak out when you get messages like that because they just need guidance and you need to believe more, you know, and that they're able to work through this because you went through it and you were able to work through it. And like, we were the kind of people that just never 
knew anything about structure. Like we were, you know, completely uh, uninformed before and we changed. So like, think about us and you have to understand like dogs change, their personalities change, and you just have to be willing to really, you know, put faith on those adopters and, and hope they understand that too. Um, and things will work out for the best, but I know working in rescue, you go through, have you guys went through those return cases where dogs get returned to you guys? And what are some of the reasons why people tell you they're returning and how does that process look like? Um, so a lot of times, I guess, I feel like a lot of reasons why dogs are returned to rescue is because the family doesn't accept or implement the guidance that is being given from the rescue. Um, and so um, pretty much all of the cases that have come back is um, I fed all my dogs in the same room and mm. they fought mm. to um, free reign of the backyard, free reign of the house on the furniture on day one, two dogs on the furniture on day one. Um, and like, we're really careful when we do meet and greets as well. So we always make sure the entire family is present. We do a 24 hour cool off period. So there's not an emotional decision being made about mm, a very cute smart. dog. Like um, the dog has to be there and like the dogs have to meet and make sure obviously that they're okay with each other. If it's my per like, so usually the way that it works is the foster does the meet and greet and the foster has a lot of say for where the dog goes, because I truly believe that the foster knows the dog the best. The foster can give me information, but I don't know that dog. I don't know what it's going through. I don't know the living situation. Um, and so like for me personally, when I have a foster, like I always make sure that we go and we walk and Sean will always tell me like, man, you're, you're just talking their ear off and you're giving them so much information. And then like when we've had fosters come back that are returned, he's like, no, I, I understand why you say what you say now. And it's like my biggest thing of dogs being returned, I think is, and even surrendered in the first place is that they, that we have a dog culture in America that is by the fancy collar, by the comfy dog bed, love your dog. But what does love mean to your dog? Love to me, if I love Millie, I'm going to give her a hug and I'm going to say, let's grab a glass of wine and let's go to dinner or okay. whatever, right? <laughs> <laughs> but if but if I love my dog, I'm going to tell my dog, I've got this. You mm -hmm. don't have to worry. I'm going to give you direction. You're in my human world. I'm going to teach you how to live here. Yep. That is how I show my dog love. But that is not what's advertised. That's not what's said. That's not what's promoted anywhere here. And so you have, that's just my opinion, obviously, <laughs> dogs. You have dogs that are, um, and I see it a lot with with boxers, because, and any breed, it doesn't really matter. But they either don't do the research before they get the dog. They don't understand the requirement. They get a dog because their family wants a dog, but they mm -hmm. have you know, four children that are under the age of five and they decided to get a puppy. Like mm -hmm. that's a sixth child. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. it's, you know, it's, I think a lot of it is lack of education for what is love to a dog yep, and how to provide direction to the dog without being forceful and without being mean, yeah. without, you know, being, either too soft or too hard, like the, where's the medium and it's just not promoted. And I think that that is why we have returns and why we have surrenders yeah. for the most part. Obviously there's circumstances that are unforeseen when people surrender dogs and that's absolutely why we exist. Yeah. 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 I think what you said of like people do the research, um, or, um, you know, or they don't do the research, right? I think also people do the wrong research, right? So mm -hmm. they look, I think, I, I would say 99% of the people adopt a dog or go out and bring a dog into their family knowing it's going to be extra work. They do know, right? It's what mm -hmm. kind of extra work, right? And they also have this, this, um, 
this mindset of, okay, yeah, I'm willing to go on walks with them or I'm willing to play with them in the backyard, but they don't account for maybe I have a more nervous dog or maybe I have a more forward um, pushy dog. They don't account for how can I make sure that I am I am who this dog needs. I'm not just doing what this dog needs to physically survive. It's I can be what this dog needs in order to survive in this world with me. It, this is not their world. We go out and we bring them into our homes. We actively see, like seek these dogs out to bring into our homes. And then we make them, we put it on them to make us feel better. We put it on them to do the work, right? And that yeah. to me is like, I think there's a couple trainers that I know that offer, and we've talked about this, Andrea and I have, that offer um, like services to support you through adopting a dog. So before you even go out and adopt a dog, this is kind of what we do with our best chance program. But if you're thinking about adopting a dog somewhere else or in a different state, I've done video consultations with people who don't have a dog yet. And they're just mm -hmm. thinking about getting a dog so they can go and, okay, what does the first week look like? What does the first month look like? That is where, that's research that needs to be done. Not um, what's the potty schedule look like. That That's the research people are doing is how much okay. exercise does this dog need? How long of a walk should I be taking them on? Not what boundaries does this dog need when it comes into my home? Not what safe spaces do I offer this dog? Yeah. And I mean, even sometimes too, the information on certain breeds is not there. Like there's been plenty of articles where I've seen, oh, Belgian Malinois can make a great family dog if you're active. What? Like that's not even accurate. Oh and <laughs> it so depends. It's like, like it wouldn't be for a first time dog owner. No way. I, right. I, well, yeah, exactly. I, but I mean, yeah. for the person that's doing, I need a good family dog and they come across that. Uh, yeah. yeah. On a the website, research out there is like, wrong. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, you know, it's taking that extra step of understanding. And that's what I, I like to do a lot of is um, I'm trying to, I tried to launch actually a group class that was for like owner education. Okay. Um, it didn't, it didn't really take as well as I wanted it to. So now I'm trying to kind of revamp what I'm going to be doing and potentially like contacting other rescues, maybe doing it as a fundraiser opportunity or something like that. But just to help get the word out there about this is what we do before we get a dog. So how much does it cost? Whether you're yeah. adopting a dog, whether you're buying it, getting it from a reputable breeder, whatever you're doing, like how much does vetting cost? How yeah. much does spay and neuter cost? How much does prevention cost? How much does training cost? How much does overnight boarding cost? All of these things need to be also taken into consideration. And if you're adding a second dog, it's two times the training. It's two times the walks. It's two times the food bill, two times the vet bill. Are they around the same age? Because you're going to ha potentially have like health issues in mm -hmm. them. Like if you get two one-year-olds, you potentially are, you're going to have two senior dogs at the same time. Um, all of these things, like I, you know, to your, what you're saying about the right type of research is important. And what I also think that people don't recognize either is you can be active, but is it your lifestyle? Because mm -hmm. I can be active on the weekend, but I can't have a Australian shepherd that only gets to go for a, one hike on the Once weekend. Once a week. Yeah. 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 So and it's, it's people who are extremely active overworking their high energy dogs and then they create monsters and the dogs don't know how to ever turn off. So it's also knowing I get that more than anything with my higher energy yeah. dogs is I have somebody who's like they're 99% of the time. It's like somebody comes in high energy dog and they're either not exercising them enough at all or they're over exercising them. And this dog is going on five mile walks every single day, um, constantly doing something. And we've just missed the, the part of it where they need to learn how to not do something. Yeah. But yes, yeah. I think it's, it is, it's absolutely the right type of research. I used to have, um, long time ago, foster for a different rescue. And I had somebody complain to me about how long the application process was. And I'm like, it's a, it's a living being, right? I mean, yeah. you look at you and they're like, well, there's dogs everywhere. Why would I need to just, you know, I, why are you screening us so much? Right. One, we, it was a pit bull rescue, right? Two, 
it was, it's still, I have to make sure that you can provide for this dog. Cause if not, we put on the thing that you get, you give the dog back. So I, I don't want to give you this dog and you go, okay, well, I don't have a fenced in backyard or I don't have this, or I have kids and the dog's too much. I want to make sure I put you with the right dog. But I've had people mm-hmm. like have this uh, mindset where it's, well, there's dogs that need homes. Why are you screening us so much? Yeah. That's why, because, because I have to make sure that this dog doesn't ever need a home again. Yep. Yeah. And there's like a whole crowd of people on Instagram too and social media that complain about that. It, it, it just makes me so angry. I have to like hold myself back. <laughs> like the other day I saw this video of a comedian just joking about how difficult it was to rescue a dog. And he was, he it's just the most tasteless joke I've ever like heard. It was not funny at all. Like he made fun of rescue dogs as if they're broken and uh, about rescues being too picky, like they don't want the dogs adopted. And I had to stop. For, I, I had to actually take time to write something there because I was like, listen, if you want a dog that bad, you can go to a shelter, yeah. pick up that dog the same day, take him home. No questions asked. Shelters just, just wants the dogs out of there. Like they are not screening people. Sadly, they can't. Um, they're overcrowded, especially here in Georgia. So go do you want a dog go there there's plenty of dogs all breeds and sizes puppies Mm -hmm. all kinds if you're adopting from a rescue that rescue has responsibility over that dog they want to make sure that it's not going to be a failure because they committed to that dog and i even talked to my family i'm like i wish i had someone to screen me before I adopted all my dogs because I have you mean someone to screen Ozzy. Oh my God. Uh, just all, cause we were all like in, from 2020 to now we Close went all in, like in one year in about two years we adopted, we have six dogs now. Um, well, cinnamon has been with us for a while and she's, and they all kind of happen. Like One of them um, is a golden doodle and the person didn't want him and our groomer find out and then she called us and then we picked him up. We're like, we'll keep him. And then the other one is from a shelter that a pit bull that my brother got and then he couldn't stay with him because he started working. We'll keep him. Um, And then we adopted a pity from a shelter spontaneously. And this is, you know, it was not my doing, but I was put on the spot brought him home. There he goes. It happened. So we just like spontaneously, like we'll take, like, we want to help all the yeah, dogs. If you we have applied the room. for another dog, if it was through our rescue or I'm assuming <laughs> Victoria's rescue, would it, it would be a that? hard no. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> These people like- are turning into hoarders. <laughs> oh, and we have like, cause we moved into a new house. We had the yard. We thought they were all going to love each other and play all day and all was going to be fine. And then personalities started to come out. Like one of them don't really like being around the other. So we have to create rotate. And then, you know, there's all sorts of things that we had to put into consideration now. And even you were talking about like, you know, in, in a couple of years, um, hopefully in a long, long time, we're going to have, a, you know, senior dogs all at once. So there's so much to consider. If I had someone to say, hey, are you sure you want to do this? Are you sure you want to have to go through this? This is the training you're going to have to do. This is the dog's personality. Like you have this dog. He's intense, but he doesn't like intensity. Like my dogs, they're living a great life, but I have to work like really hard. And thankfully we have the ability to put in the work to, you know, all things, all dogs connected, but it's not easy, you know, and but then- you enjoy it. And a lot of people don't, and that's okay. Yeah. Right. Like it's okay. If you don't enjoy, um, making it work, like you do, you love your dogs and you enjoy the training process. And that's why it's okay for you to have six dogs that have, um, that need a little tinkering when it comes to how you put them together. Right. Um, but a lot of people don't, they have, you know, four kids or a crate, you know what I mean? Like a lot of people just don't have or don't want to do it. Right. And, but that's where you have to make sure if you are adopting from a rescue, you are asking, that's the best part of adopting from a rescue is that you have a foster who's going to tell you exactly what you need to know about that dog and the transition into your home and what's required of you for success. For sure. I was just about to say, like, I applaud you for signing up for crate rotating forever. Like, It's hard enough to even get our fosters to create rotate for the first, you know, week or so, (laughs) let alone somebody that's, you know, doing it for the whole, you know, your whole dog's life. And, um, like, I think that that is 
amazing. Like I, I love that you're willing to do that and that you have that, but a hundred percent really not everybody is able or willing to do that. So, um, you know, I think that to back to the original question, Andrea too, about there's why dogs get returned or surrendered to is that they, everybody wants the dog to move too fast. So mm. we want, we really want to <laughs> yes. introduce them to our friends and we want to introduce them to our dog and we want to introduce them to the cat or whatever. And we have to remember that it doesn't matter if your dog is eight weeks old that you got from a reputable breeder or it's 10, your house and your environment is new. They don't know what the rules are. They don't know what the boundaries are. They don't even know if you have these situations under control or if they feel like they have to step up to the plate and start, you know, doing all of these things in the house because they don't, they don't know. And there's definitely a honeymoon period as well. And I'm very much a stickler on this It for the, for my rescue is that the foster has to have that dog for a minimum of a month. We don't even, because you don't know that dog, in my opinion, that you don't know what that dog's personality is, what that dog's temperament is, how they're going to react to vaccines, how they're going to do all of these things until you're able to get with the dog. So if you're fostering a dog for a week, that dog could be amazing. That dog mm-hmm. is either scared out of his mind, it's not comfortable yet, you're on guard, so you're doing a much better job. But when you start to... the the rules start to be lax. The dog starts testing boundaries. The dog starts getting more comfortable. Now, all of a sudden, you're starting to see that dog's true personality, good, bad, or indifferent. It doesn't really matter. But if you're burning through these dogs, you don't know these dogs. Mm-hmm. To find that perfect home or not perfect, but you know, a good fit for that dog that's willing to take them on or whatever. So I think... You know, I think that that's, yeah, I would say a lot of times surrenders and returns are either people not fully engaging and listening or they know better and or they don't properly exercise dogs. Like I tell my clients this all the time is that I feel like we could fix your, you wouldn't, I wouldn't have a job if people properly exercise their dogs and implemented some level of boundaries at home. Yep. Because from a rescue world, from a training world, it's, I think that that is a huge disadvantage that that information isn't out there. And I think also, Millie, maybe you can relate to this, but I also don't think that there's a lot of trainers that are also talking about that. About exercise? About the boundaries. I think it's more of Oh yeah. Uh, That's, that's the biggest problem is that, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've been to a session and I am not the first trainer, which I make a point to not ever, like I'm not, I, I don't like to say I'm the fifth trainer or whatever, because I don't like to, I can't, I think it's a braggy thing. And I also think that I don't know if any of my clients, it's very likely some of my clients have gone to trainers after me. Right. So to me, that's like a big red flag, but, um, but yeah, there's a, there's a lot of times where I have a client come in, same behavioral issues. They've, they've been to other trainers. Uh, they've done board and trains. They've done, you know, somebody who maybe said that they were a psychology based trainer, but they were never, ever asked, does the dog sleep in the crate? Does the dog, is the dog on the furniture? It, like right. they were never asked any, is there any sort of no dog zone in your house or what are the rules and boundaries that you have on a day to day? A lot of trainers and I don't get me wrong. I used to be like this. I used to go, okay, leash reactivity. There's a problem with the leash walk, right? Not leash reactivity. What rule, what does your dog uh, see you as? Who does your dog see you as? Is it somebody who can take control for them? Is it somebody who is capable of driving the car well, better than they are? But yeah, I mean, a lot of trainers go right into, I can solve the problem, but I can't, um, I can't cure the actual thing underneath it, right? Because we don't know what it is until we ask questions about day-to-day life at the house. Exactly. And I was the same way too. When I first started, I, you know, was more heavy on like corrections and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I, and that's part of the reason why I, even Kaya to this day still we're still working through leash reactivity because it's a constant, it's a battle. Reactivity and insecurity is something that you have to be on your game and you have to also accept that your dog may never be this confident dog that you want to, that you 
thought that they were going to be. The way that I think about it is like, what if you were, what if your husband was severely insecure? That wouldn't be solved in just six weeks, right? Of marriage counseling. That's something that would come up in a lot of different conversations that you would have to work through, that you would have to make sure you support through. You can say things to prevent that insecurity to come up, but it's going to come up and you have to be aware of that and you have to be um, able to have to work through those things, but it's not something that just goes away. If you have an insecure dog, you, you have an insecure dog for the rest of their life. You might be able to build confidence in certain situations in certain areas, but that's something that you are going to have to, it's going to be a part of a lot of conversations regardless. Like you said, yeah. it's a battle, right? Yes. And you can teach your dog everything, how to act in these situations, but, and you can even help them to feel better about it. Yeah. But something may come up, like you said, tomorrow and all of a sudden they're insecure again, because mm-hmm. that's what their root personality is. Um, and, you know, we've gone through the, the heavy corrections with, I feel like Kaya's like, as your company name is like literally my mere image of my entire yeah. training training journey because it's um you know she's everybody always makes fun of me because she is me and but like she's done she's my guinea pig like I've done every single thing that I've learned I've tried with her and we've come so far and we have an amazing relationship and a bond now but it's um it, even like clients and things like that will be like oh my god you have a, a dog that's reactive I'm like Yes, they exist. Like I'm a trainer. I'm not a magician. (laughs) And, um, to like, to your point of other trainers or people come to me and I, you know, I don't, to me, it's like, I just want to help you. I don't really care. Like how many you've gone through on this. I feel the same way as you, because there's people that maybe didn't like my style or maybe they didn't. Absolutely. They, and they have found somebody else and it worked. And what I always tell my clients is that we're going to take a, a little bit longer to get there, but I'm not covering up what is going on. So can I get your dog to not react to that dog? Sure. I, there's lots of things that I can do to get that dog to not react, but I'm not changing their mindset about it. Mm-hmm. I'm not helping them feel that dog or that frustration or that fear or whatever is causing the reactivity. I'm not actually addressing the problem if I'm suppressing it. Right. So I can distract it or I can suppress it or I can work through it and we're yep. going to work through it, which yep. means you have to be super uncomfortable being uncomfortable and with your dog acting like a nutcase yeah. because <laughs> the more you get comfortable with that, the more your dog is like, Oh, that's not really a big deal and yep. we can work through it. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I kind of don't remember where I was going with that, but, or how that started, but well, the anyways. rules and boundaries. I mean, that's the whole yeah. thing of like, it's people go that we, you know, a lot of trainers will go straight in an issue and they'll, you know, give a treat to distract yes, it, or they'll give a giant correction to suppress it. But what we need to do is it's how you live with your dog. And we need to truly change why that behavior is happening. And it is, it's uncomfortable on both ends. And that's why mm-hmm. I am okay. Like it doesn't, I don't have, I'm saying this and it's going to sound like I have people walking away every two seconds, but it never surprises me if somebody doesn't come back for a follow-up, right? It doesn't happen very often, but it, it, when it, when it does happen, I go, okay, well, that makes sense. That was, uh, it's a big ask, right? I'm saying Mm -hmm. you're going to be uncomfortable. This isn't going to be, um, the most fun process because there is something here and we have to work through it. And it's going to require day in and day out at home. That's going to require really uncomfortable situations on walks, but we can do it. And I can actually help you solve it long-term not just for, um, not just in the moment, making them feel better or distracting them. Victoria, how do you, um, sorry, go ahead. That's okay. Oh, no, No, I was just going to ask, how do you set goals with your clients? Uh, what does that conversation look Mm -hmm. like when you are setting training goals and having that conversation with them? A lot of times I like to find out, you know, what, Like, I like to meet the dog. I like to meet the person. I like to understand what is their daily life. And basically when I'm going through boundaries and things like that, I also am looking at their facial expression. I'm looking at their body language. I'm like, okay, what are we going to be able to do? Because I always tell people, 
Um, and I think Millie says very similar things that I do is just from listening to on the podcast is that like, we have to put something together that works for them because Mm -hmm. I can come in full guns blazing of no furniture, sleep in the crate, do this, do that, whatever. And they're like, I'm out. That's not going to work. I'm like, okay, what are you comfortable doing? Yeah. How do we, I said, you let's start where you're comfortable because that's what you're going to do. And then as we progress, understand that if your dog's behavior is not improving, we may have to go to an uncomfortable place. And this is how I really help people work through these issues. And I always try to tell people, I'm here to give you advice. What you take from me is completely up to you. And I'm not saying that you have to implement every little thing that I say. I'm giving you tons of suggestions for how to set boundaries or how to make things a little bit easier for you in your your house because it's not you know it's definitely not fun to have a dog that you can't walk right because that's just you know I mean you got a dog to walk with them but we they're But also we have to remove this expectation that you're going to tie a rope around your dog's neck and all of a sudden they're just going to walk next to you because that happens a lot too of, I just want my dog to walk nicely. I'm Mm -hmm. like there. And I always tell them and set up goals of, we have to work on what's going on in the house. We have to look at what's going on on your walks. We have to look at your relationship and it's going to be a really holistic approach to this and we're going to take it one week at a time Yeah. because I don't know if it's going to take you six months. It's going to take you a year. It could take you five years, but also looking at your dog, if it's a nervous dog, I'm not going to tell you that we're going to make your dog a happy go lucky dog. Right. Right. Because no. that's not a thing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, what you said of like, if you come in full, full guns blazing, right. You almost, I hope I never get to a point in my career that I become jaded. And I think that asking people to create rules and boundaries in their house is a small ask, right? It's not, Mm -hmm. it's a big ask. It's a lot for a lot of people and it requires a whole different schedule. It requires a whole different way of looking at your relationship with your dog. But I am, I'm very, I think the thing that I will tell my clients is this is what I would suggest, right? Um, If it, if some of this is not feasible for you and I never, I'm, I'm a little bit different in the way that you say it of, it's going to make you uncomfortable. The whole thing is, right? <laughs> but if something is not feasible because you have a child who has to wake up for school at a certain time or like it, schedule-wise something doesn't work, then we can move around it. But it's mm-hmm. not, I to me, you being uncomfortable with creating rules and boundaries is not enough of a good reason because your dog has been uncomfortable this whole time, right? So now yeah. you have to give me a real good reason why we're not gonna do this, but I also tell people, because I've had people very much so come in and be like, I'm don't even talk to me about getting my dog off the bed because <laughs> it's not going to happen. Right. Um, I still try and sometimes I have success, but I will tell people that, OK, well, if we're not going to do it the whole way, then we're not going to have the whole way of success. Right. So there's not I can't get you. Um, I can only get you as far as you're going to take it, but I'm not going I can't the dog's not going to change more than you are. For but, sure. No, that's yeah. a really good way to put it because it's it is a hundred percent and like that's what I always try to tell people too it's like I understand this is hard I'm not saying that this is easy and I'm not saying that it's fun if you have a fenced in backyard to put your dog on a leash and take him outside especially when that is the worst thing that you could do with your dog you know like especially when that's that's a horrible experience for both of you exactly and it's like and in Michigan, it's freezing. Oh, yeah. So it's like... True. You win. <laughs> like, you win. <laughs> like, yes. Are you so excited to put your snow pants on yeah. and your boots and your coat every time your dog has to pee? No, me either. But when if you don't have a solid recall, you're going to have to. Or right. you know what you're going to do? Chase your dog around your yard. <laughs> yep. With, with, potentially without your snow pants on. <laughs> exactly. Because you're not prepared. <laughs> exactly. So... um. Yeah, that's kind of, um, or that's a hundred percent accurate. Um, yeah. Can you guys hang on one second? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I'll be right back. Okay, okay. No, no worries. So I think now we can even go into because we We're talked a lot about. Yeah, yeah. I think we can. Like, I'm gonna possibly. I'm just gonna probably ask her 
to touch bases on like how she thinks every dog is unique, you know, and what that means. And then I think we can wrap it up. Yeah. Because we almost, we're almost at an hour anyways. I also think we already touched on the whole, every dog is unique a little bit, but. True. 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 Wait, we have. a really cool accent. We have one. We have another episode Friday, right? So Uh, I think I'm going to, I'm going to lunch this one on Monday. Okay. Okay. This episode on Monday. Okay. Because we don't really have like regular episodes. We just have consultations. Yeah. And please remember to watch that one that. Oh, might not yes. be worthy of okay <laughs> don't just post them please no 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 no. that okay. one i know i need and if we do i know i need to go and contact um to do like a waiver thing you know because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. i think like we're gonna need it on that one yeah i think maybe we don't post that one though i don't know <laughs> have you heard anything uh-uh. Uh-uh. Okay, well, that's good. but yeah that one was um just watch it <laughs> It's going to need, that one is going to need a lot of editing. (laughs) Sorry, I was talking about a different um, video consultation that I had for the podcast. I can hear you. Can you hear us? Can you hear us? Hang on a second. Okay. I think you have to change. I don't think I can hear you guys. Hang on. Let me see if I can change anything here. No. You probably have to change your microphone to your headphones. I don't know if she could hear me. You should sign language it out. <laughs> don't you know sign language? I need to change this thing. I just okay. re- sorry, I couldn't hear you for a second. Can you hear I us? Hear you now. Okay, now perfect. I can hear you. Okay, perfect. Okay. okay. Um, sorry, I had to go to the bathroom. No, you're, no, fine, you're fine. You're fine. <laughs> and I think we're about to like probably start wrapping it up. And I'm Andrea's better sure. at doing that. So because uh, we're okay. at an hour now, so I'll have Andrea perfect. start. Yeah, so I think we're we really covered a lot in this episode. And I Victoria, can you tell us, you know, all of the services that you offer to clients, um, personal sessions? Do you offer group sessions? Um, you're in Michigan. How can people find you and connect with you? Do you offer like virtual consults? Uh, let's go more into that so our listeners know how to reach you. Sure. Um, I do private sessions. I do in home and on site where people come to me. And I also do training camps where um, they come to the dogs get dropped off um, Monday through Friday. I usually recommend two consecutive weeks for that. um, But it doesn't have to be. Um, The dogs always go home on the weekend, they get homework um, before they come back to me. And they always get a 30 day transition plan of how does the dog go from being with me to being back with them. Um, I also do day trains. So if somebody is doing like a private lessons with me and they just need a little bit extra help, but they're, they don't want to do like a full camp there. I do offer day trains where we can work on something specific. Maybe it's, you want your dog to go to the park or you want your dog to be better on place or whatever. We can work on anything. Um, during that session. Um, I do do some virtual um, consults and help and just answering questions. I do um, mostly there through the rescue in in Michigan, but I do offer them. Um, And I don't do any group classes right now. Um, And my Instagram is Victoria life with dogs. Um, so you can find me on there. I post a lot of different things and fun reels and information on there as well. And my website is from the hard dog services.com. So if you have any questions or want to connect with me, um, those are the best ways to do it. Awesome. And then it's boxer heaven rescue, right? That's your rescue. Yep. Boxer haven rescue boxer haven. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Boxer Haven Rescue and um, only boxers. So if anyone is interested in adopting a boxer, make sure to check them out. And do you do you adopt out of state or are you guys just in Michigan right now? So we do some. Oh, that's the one thing I forgot to say is I'm in near the Detroit area. So I am in Royal Oak, Michigan, which is about 20 minutes outside of Detroit. Um, and our rescue is a Michigan based rescue, but we do, um, do some in Indiana and some in Ohio. It really just depends because we have to do home checks and we also have to transport the dog. So the 
you know, I mean, we'll make exceptions, but people that are like super far away, we can't take surrenders from them or we can't adopt out. So, um, but we're mostly in Michigan. We're all over the state of Michigan, Ohio and Indiana. We've definitely expanded into, but beyond that, it's very diff. It's like a one-off situation if yeah. we have transports and things like that. Perfect. Got it. Yeah. I love talking to you today because you really just align with everything that you're doing from rescue to the training. And it's, you know, our, we, we started this podcast to connect with people and to talk about, make the conversation realistic, you know, cause we're not just talking about training as like this recipe based, uh, method that you follow this recipe, whoever you are, what kind, whatever kind of dog you have, it's going to work, you know? And that sometimes like we talked about it, it can work for some people. They can be absolutely happy with following a recipe and doing it their way. But we're here for the people that those things didn't work for and they feel lost mm -hmm. and they don't know what, where to turn and they love their dog, but they don't know what to do and what it even means to connect with your dog. You know, the difficult dogs are not broken. The difficult dogs are not, um, you know, they shouldn't be treated differently or have a poor lifestyle because they have different personalities. And I think the sooner that the more conversations we create around the topic that dogs are individuals, they have unique personalities. You should understand their breed, but you should also understand their personality traits. And you should look more into yourself before you point finger at your dog um, about their issues. And we, I mean, with social media, with so much information that's out there, we see it so many different aspects of this. But a lot of it is the owners posting the videos of the dogs doing something really bad. And they're like, why did you do this? And they're showing the world that their dog tore a hole through the wall or they ripped up the couch. And it's like the dog's bad. But no, that's like a reflection of you and your lack of boundaries and your lack of ability to connect with your dog and give them what they need. So I, I really hope, I mean, that's our whole message with this podcast. That's, when we started this, we were like, what are we going to talk about? Because <laughs> really it's like, I talk about the same things. It's like boundaries, crave, connecting with your dog. What do you need? Place? Like, what else are we going to talk about? Because if I keep telling them to do the same things and I don't know um, their situation, it's going to be difficult, you know, for us to to connect with them and like tell them what they need. Right. Um, but I just, mm -hmm. you know, I really want to thank you for joining us once again, Victoria, and I'm going to drop all of your links on the description. So whoever needs to connect, wants to connect with Victoria, they can just click on the description and go to the website, the Instagram. And, um, thank you so much. We hope to have you thank on again. You. So, well, thank you very much. It was really nice to be here and I'm so excited that I was able to chat with you guys today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Until next time. <laughs> Bye. Yeah. Bye. Make sure to follow us on Instagram at Think Like a Dog Podcast and follow at Mirror Image Canine for training tips. If you have any questions, please reach out to us via email at info at thinklikeadogpodcast.com.